Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 182 of the Board Game Barrage podcast. It's a sad day today. Mark and I just witnessed the defeat of England. Yeah, you have to apologize in advance if we're a little hoarse because uh, <laughs> yeah, we were screaming at if the end. My there. voice has never sounded better through this huskiness. It's because we spend all afternoon cheering. I think we're in the husky phase of the voices, but I think if we'd recorded this about 20 minutes after the game, it would have been a much worse situation. Right. It would have been more of like 14-year-old boy voice cracking sort of situation. You both sound like you need like a cigarette and like you guys like... We've just spent seven hours at the pub together. You know what I mean? Yep. That's about right. We did it, but England didn't do it. We did it? Yeah, exactly. You know, what's another (laughs) two, four, six, eight years? Right. This week on the Board Game Barrage podcast, we are going to be returning to our draft of the Board Game Geek Top Games. We did the Top 100 already. That went spectacularly for Mark and Mark alone. And this week, we're going to be going to the next 100 games. The Board Game Geeks, number 101 to 200 top games. If you missed our last episode where we drafted, the way this works, we're going to be drafting a collection of five games. And then you, the listeners, will get to vote on your favorite collection of five games. And everyone who votes has a chance to win a gift card for $50 to their favorite board game store. That's coming up later in the episode. But before we get there, let's talk about the games that we've been playing this week. And this week, we're going to be talking about Chinatown with Kellen. I'm going to be covering my plays of Curious Cargo. And Mark's going to be telling us a little bit about Mercado de Lisboa. So, Kellen, why don't you kick us off with Chinatown? Yes. (coughs) We're going to Chinatown. Uh, I have to, like, pull aside all my draft stuff, you know, (laughs) which I have up on my seven monitors here. (laughs) Chinatown is one of the most highly rated negotiation games in all of existence. I went and checked right before we started recording. It is the third highest rated game on Board Game Geek with negotiation elements sitting at rank 370. And the only games above it are the amazing Cosmic Encounter and the disappointing Rising Sun. In Chinatown, you are trying to build out a Chinatown that you would see in like a San Francisco-like city, you are able to trade essentially everything. You are drawing tiles with different types of businesses, whether that's a dim sum shop, whether that's a factory, and you are drawing lots that represent places on the city. And so if you've ever played a game like Acquire or a game like Lords of Vegas, you have first access to spot 31, first access to spot 47, And then you free trade, where you can trade your money, you can trade your lots, you can trade the types of businesses that you have in order to get better producing buildings. And the way that that works is that an incomplete type of business will produce less money than a complete type of business. So each business in the game has a different amount of orthogonally adjacent business units that it needs to be to be complete. So for an example, a jewelry store needs four orthogonally adjacent jewelry stores next to it in order to be a complete jewelry store. And then at the end of each round, it will score as a complete jewelry store. So that means in order to complete that, you will need four orthogonally adjacent lots and then four jewelry tiles. So you're going to need a lot of things to make that happen versus you know a laundry business, which actually needs five, and then it goes all the way down to three. And so every trade that you are essentially making with someone, you're saying, well, I'll trade you this takeout tile and that lot for $20,000 and we'll trade for that lot because I really need it. And then they can look at the board and say, well, you're actually going to get, if that becomes a complete business, that's going to be worth $400,000 to you over the course of this game because it's going to pay out in round three, round four, round five, and round six. So the earlier you complete one of these businesses, the better. This game is chaos incarnate. It really feels like you can wheel and deal and trade anything. And the money is really free flowing. I think with a new group, you don't know how much anything is worth. And the first two rounds are sort of like, eh, what do I do? So I introduced this to a new group of gamers. And I have played this before. Chinatown absolutely holds up as a negotiation game. 
but I am not sure that I love the straight, straight, straight negotiation games as much as I used to. I think there are types of games that layer on mechanisms to this, like a diplomacy, like a cosmic encounter, where it's not just negotiation, it's negotiation plus something else, where Chinatown is very literally, all you're doing is yelling and arguing and trading, and it's a good game. Mark, I know you have played Chinatown. How do you feel about it? I was uh, really excited to play Chinatown the first time I got it played, and I've since played it a couple more times. And while I have enjoyed those plays, it didn't really hit the heights that I was hoping for. When I first got into gaming, Chinatown was way out of print, and it was sort of, uh, to me, and I think to a lot of people, a grail game. And I think when you talk about these grail out of print games, they always sort of like in your mind, feel like they're going to be something that is untouchable by any other sort of game. So I I was hunting it down for a long time. But in the end, where I think it sort of fell flat for me is I think it's a little too, and maybe this comes to your point, Kellen, that it's just like a pure negotiation game. It felt too mathy to me. Once the second and third rounds, once the sort of board has been established, it's sort of, I feel like, too easy to figure out what a tile is potentially worth. And so, you know, if, if my tile is worth 20000 to you, you know, we come up to 10000 and you take it. It just feels too, like, cut and dried, the trading to me. I don't know if that's been your experience. No, I think that's probably the biggest criticism of Chinatown is that the last round, especially, yeah. it's just a math exercise. You know what something is worth to someone else. So then the question is, am I helping someone who's in a place higher than me? You know, if they're in first right. place, I'm not going to make this 50-50 deal. But if we're both in last well, it might be worth doing. And so what you are trading on ostensibly is the potential, right? So Neelan's business is in a corner, so it will never be a complete business. But if he acquires that lot or this tile, it could be worth that much. And so Neelan is essentially making a bet on what his business could be, even with the lack of tiles that he currently has. And so there's a little bit of luck in there. Some of the best moments, though, really happen when you get three and four way trades, because it actually does happen in this game where everyone needs someone else's tile. And so it's like, well, let's do a four way trade all around the table. And then someone goes, well, I'll do that trade as long as Kellen isn't a part of the trade. And so there really is a lot of opportunity to screw with people. I think this has long been uh, one of the games that Shut Up and Sit Down has highly espoused. I think for me, I'm the boss is my favorite pure negotiation game, but that is also rife with other silliness. And these are both made in the 90s. You know, and I know we have Sidereal Confluence now, Neelan's negotiation game du jour. Is that how you say mm-hmm. that? Du jour? Yeah, that Did works. I do it right? Negotiation game du jour. It sounds like mustard to me. <laughs> Am I wrong? Du jour. Du jour, du jour yeah. Yeah, that's different. Du jour. But close, but close. But, but with that said, I do think it would definitely be worth the experience of having Neelan try Chinatown. And I do think that for at least four or five or six games, you will not really know that value. And it's sort of the experience of learning that. It's almost like as long as I had a new different group of people to teach Chinatown to, I'd be happy to keep it in my collection, but it is not at the forefront. And and then again, I think if you're a negotiation board gamer, you probably already played this because again, third ranked ever. But It was fun to revisit this one. I played it with my uh, brother and his friend group who had not played it before. And this is the same group that I revisited Genoa with a previous week. So we had a really great time with Chinatown. But it is showing its age just a little bit, even though third ranked best negotiation game. The only ones better are quote unquote rising sun with that negotiation that you can do in that game. And on the spectrum of even the negotiation games we're talking about, this is like very much on the lighter end with the exception of maybe I'm the boss. Is that right? Yeah, it's probably sub 90 minutes once it's really moving and clicking and it's really just how long you want to negotiate. Yeah, there's definitely some randomness, right? So the way you draw lots is you draw more than the required amount and then you discard some. But then when you draw the different tiles for your business, it's just LOL, put your hand in the bag. Right, right. So definitely, definitely on the lighter end. I even just meant in terms of like accessibility, right? Because once you step up to like even like a Genoa, that's a fair leap, I would think. Yes, I would say that like sidereal is a huge leap for all mankind onto the moon and Genoa rests somewhere between this, but I'm sure BGG would disagree with their amazing weight rating that they use. And that is Chinatown, a negotiation game that you should try if you love negotiation games. 
I played a couple of games of Curious Cargo. This is a game by Ryan Courtney and Capstone. Ryan Courtney, previously the designer of Pipeline, one of my favorite games, in fact, is still on my top 50 list, even though it's sliding down a little bit. And essentially what Curious Cargo seems to be is if Ryan Courtney just took the element of Pipeline, which funnily enough, is maybe the most divisive part of Pipeline, at least for me personally, where you're actually laying the tiles in order to create your network of pipes, kind of like the pipe dream video game nightmare, where you're connecting these pipes together and they make this crazy, twisted, convoluted network of pipes intersecting each other. That is the entirety of the game of Curious Cargo. The way that this breaks down is that you have a player board with some machines and then conveyor belts that run down the left and right and side, And there's a phase where what you're doing is drawing tiles and placing them. And every tile has, in the simplest version of the game, two different colors of pipes that sort of interconnect and connect one end of the tile to the other. So you're lining up these tiles, trying to create a chain that goes from the machines to the conveyor belts on either side. Then there's a second phase of the game, which is this truck phase. And you play a card to put a truck out. And if the bays of the truck line up with a active connection, a pipe that's running all the way from one of those bays to a machine, you're delivering a good. And that's great for you. That's victory points at the end of the game. But then something else kind of cool happens. As that truck moves along your edge of the board and it gets to the end, it then goes into your opponent's receiving end. They then also have a chance to receive that good in order to get points themselves. So there's kind of this balance of like, do I want to focus on the left-hand side of my board for shipping stuff out? Or wait, no, hang on, Neelan's just about to send a truck with a lot of blue things on it. I now have to make sure that the right-hand side of my board has enough blue pipes to receive them. This is specifically a two-player game. So that little dynamic is specifically between you and one other player. And there's a couple of other fun little ways to interact with that system where anytime you play a truck, it doesn't even have to be to your board. It can be to your opponent's board so you can force their truck network up their board in a way that, you know, if they're just languishing, waiting to fill a truck, you can sort of stop them from doing that a little bit. I would say that my biggest issue with Curious Cargo on the whole, which is a very pleasant little game, is kind of in a little bit of surprising rules grid. Mark and I were talking about this earlier today, where when you read the rule book for the first time, you almost feel like this seems too heavy for what it is. Like there's just a lot of weird little rules. Because I haven't even gone into some of the ways that this actually manifests in terms of action points and tokens you can trade in and tokens you can trade in for other tokens. And this is going to sound bizarre, but four different victory conditions and different ways that the game can end. Sometimes the game goes to points, sometimes it doesn't. There's just a lot of weird stuff to have to explain for a game that should be very simple, fun, lay down pipes, make a mess of your board, and you're over and done in like half an hour. And the game is not that long. It's still only like maybe 45 minutes, but it just kind of feels like this should have been simpler for how wacky it is and like one of the games that comes to mind is like galaxy trucker of just kind of like that kind of frantic weirdness where you're kind of just putting some stuff and you're never going to get the tiles like quite line up in the right way and you just end up with this mess and it's kind of hilarious but you sort of have to make the most of that but then there's just this overhead to the game that just feels odds with it that said i like this a lot i definitely want to play more of this it's not in the upper echelon of my simple two-player tile laying games it doesn't match patchwork by a long measure but definitely cute and beautiful art and beautiful production by Quan Chai Moria and Capstone Games. Mark, did you say that you'd play this or you were interested in trying it? Yeah, no, I, I have it and I was at one point going to break it out, but then took a cursory read through of the rules and thought it might just be too complicated. Like I wasn't really getting it on that really first quick run through. I For some reason, I imagined that it would be like the pipe part of Pipeline but sort of just that, I was expecting something much simpler. So when I skimmed through the rule book and I was like, oh, this is actually way more than I am ready to introduce to this player, I put it aside. You were saying that in the end, it's a little simpler than my initial fear, but maybe it sounds like not yeah. quite as simple as maybe we both had hoped. Totally. And I yeah. think that's kind of where it gets a little bit odd. It is simpler than that first read of the rule book would have you think. And actually, yeah. once you're playing it, like a lot of the play is simultaneous and it's going very quickly. You construct your truck, you construct your truck, you construct your truck. And both of those phases are simple. But yeah, it's the fine grainedness to some of the rules, especially when it comes around like the way it ends and the scoring. Because like, it's one of those weird things where even as I played my first game of it, I didn't know 
how the game was going to end. Like, is it more likely to end based on this? Is it more likely to end based on this? Will it even come down to points? Because there's this whole other scoring condition where if you get to one of these star achievements, the game ends immediately and that player wins. So I thought that that was what, how the game was likely to end, but it wasn't, you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it's to not have like the end goal in mind, it, to me is like one of the cardinal sins a board game can commit, to not have a clear idea of what you're trying to do to end the game and win. I imagine that curve obviously disappears entirely after a couple of games, especially in the context of two-player games where you're playing it repeatedly with the same person. But yeah, I, I have to imagine that's going to be a barrier for a lot of people. It strikes me that this may fit into a category that is hard to define, which is like sub 90 minute heavy er two player game. Like, what do you play in that realm? Because you're like, does it beat patchwork? And it's sort of like, we're not even in the same echelon of gamer. And so, you know, we do have that rise through COVID-19 of a lot of people playing just two player games at home. And so something like this may be exactly what they're looking for, for a certain type of gamer. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think that if you found yourself playing more and more over the last year with a specific person, this could be a good next game to try with them because it, that puzzle, that tile laying puzzle is satisfying. I enjoy it a lot, especially now that I've gotten past the point where the edges feel like edges. But yeah, that is Curious Cargo. Uh, another also just a beautiful little production by Capstone Games. Lovely little flexible plastic boards with a lot of them. So varying layouts you can play with. An advanced version of the game where you're managing three colors of pipes instead of two, which seems like a nightmare to me right now. But yeah, very cool game. That's Curious Cargo. Mark, tell us about Mercado de Lisboa. I can sum up Mercado de Lisboa in a very simple analogy piggybacking off of what Neilan just talked about with Curious Cargo. Curious Cargo is to Mercado de Lisboa as Pipeline is to Lisboa. These are both games that take a small part of a bigger game and expand on them. So as Curious Cargo takes the pipelining part of Pipeline and expands it, Mercado de Lisboa takes the marketplace part of Lisboa and expands it out. I have never played Lisboa. I'm very eager to play Lisboa. But that is what I have been told about Mercado de Lisboa. Mercado de Lisboa by Vitala Serda and Julian Pombo. And I would encourage people who have a, a few minutes to kill to go to Julian Pombo's BGG user page because he has a heck of a uh, profile picture. Very, very tough looking. It looks like he's out of like an 80s action movie. Anyway, <laughs> Mercado de Lisboa is a much, much lighter game than Vital's usual fare. What it is basically is an abstract area majority tile placing game sort of an interesting twist on this is you know lisboa takes place back when there was a great fire in lisboa a few hundred years back mercado lisboa takes that marketplace and, and is a present day marketplace so that's a sort of a fun aesthetic aspect to it so what you're doing is you've got a five by five grid and you're going to be placing stands on these grids and what you're trying to do is you're trying to place uh, stands of one of five types to match customers that want that type of food. So for example, if you got a fish stand, you want to match that fish stand with a customer on the same row or column that is looking for fish. So on your turn, you've got a choice of just four things that you can do. You can open a stand, which means taking one of your stands and placing it on the board. Another thing you can do is you can bring customers. So this is the way that you score. You match up, as I mentioned, a stand with a customer. So in lieu of placing one of your own stands, you can take one of the available customers that is on sort of a sideboard and place it on a row or column. Of course, if you place a customer in one of the spots, they will score any matching stand in that row or column, which might include your opponent. So if your opponent has a fish stand in a column and you put a fish stand there, your fish stand may score, but your opponents may score as well. The third thing you can do on your turn is in lieu of those two actions, opening a restaurant, which adds to the value of any matching stand next to it. So for example, if I have a fish stand and I place a sushi stand next to it, my fish stand will get more money if there's a customer that matches up. So for every type of stand, there's a matching sort of customer. So for a tomato stand, if I have it, if I open a pizza restaurant next to it, my tomato stand is worth more. And like everything else in this game, if I open up that pizza restaurant, my opponents can sort of piggyback off the infrastructure I've built to build their own tomato stand and therefore make their tomato stand worth more. So it's a very tight sort of puzzle where you are trying to make your opponents build up the infrastructure and sort of piggyback on it and jump on the spots that they've created for you to sort of score 
residually. Let the, let them do the work and score on their backs. There's also a timing aspect because the types of customers that are available are limited. So if you see a group of three customers that are looking for tomatoes, there's a multiplying system where if I have a tomato stand and I place a three customer token, it's three times one. So you want bigger groups of customers to come to you and you want to sort of like place those to benefit you the most. For all the tomatoes and pizza and sushi and tea houses and all that, it is a very, very abstract game and it feels abstract almost from the get-go. The art is great and it's very colorful and bright and all that, but it does feel very abstract. I enjoyed it. I've only played it twice and I will say that my second time, after the freshness had sort of left after the first play and having played it again, it seemed to dip a little bit in terms of how excited I was to play it. And it feels to me, and, and I have a friend who's played this a number of times, and for him, repeated plays of it, the enjoyment sort of got less and less with each play because you sort of realize what the strategies are and sort of adapt to it. That said, I did enjoy my two plays. I would definitely play it again. I just don't know if it has the staying power. But if you like puzzly sort of games that have an abstract idea to it where you're trying to figure out the best way to building off of opponent's structure and trying to like find the most efficient solutions to issues, Mercado de Lisboa is a nice choice. It also plays up to four. I've heard the two-player game is fine, maybe a little more on the cutthroat side. I've played it at higher player counts, so I can't speak to the two-player, but it affords the opportunity to play at different player counts. How long did it end up taking at four players at the, at the max count? Very quick. Yeah, that's another thing. This game is done in 45 minutes tops. Oh, I mean, cool. the box says 30 to 45, and that's very accurate. I mean, you could definitely get a four-player game of this done in 35 minutes, for sure. I kind of just love the idea of Vitalis Soda making a light 30-minute game like just something about that is super cool to me yeah and unlike other lacerta games the length of the gameplay is is obviously a clue to this but it is a very simple game to teach as well it's really simple to get going is there any connection at all to food chain magnate something about your description and looking at the board just makes me think about food chain magnate yeah i can see there's a flavor to that the idea of like trying to best work off the infrastructure others have built yeah there is a flavor to that you know with a game like food chain magnet versus this game which is goes by so fast you're not going to get anything near a one-to-one but yeah there is a little bit of that to it for sure i think this has to be the next great trend right like if we take to ken you you've got like 17 filler games there sure. perfect Break every one of out. those is its own little game i love it well, this is what Uve did, right? With taking the tiling of Feast for Odin, you know, making patchwork, right? Wasn't that the idea? No, it was the other way around, wasn't it? He made patchwork first and then put it in Feast for Odin? I thought it was that way as well. Patchwork is 2014. Feast for Odin is 2016. Yeah. yeah, but I still think that he was working on like developing Feast for Odin. Something about what you're saying is ringing true to me. Like, Patrick ends up coming out first, but it came from the design work of A Feast for Odin? Like, that's what I, my understanding, but I mean, who cares? But uh, I yeah, think that's what I, I don't know. I don't know that that's true, but that uh, something about that is like ringing a bell. Right. It's funny. I don't take the puzzle in Feast for Odin nearly as seriously as I do in Patchwork or right. whatever it's worth. And I think part of that is because that's the entire game in Patchwork. Yeah, and also the patchwork grid is so much smaller, so you have to be more... Yeah, thing about interesting. It. And that is Mercado de Lisboa by Vital Acerta and Julian Pombo. So yeah, before we move on to this week's draft, one thing I think is worth mentioning is that if you enjoyed the top 100 draft that we already did a few episodes back, we actually did a follow one to that where we redrafted the top 100 using the 85 games that were left over. So things get a little bit more tight. Things get a little bit more messy because all of the best 15 games, if you ask us at least, have already gone. So that is an, a Patreon exclusive bonus episode. So if you would like to hear that where things get even more feisty, Head over to boardgamebarrage.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash boardgamebarrage. And there's a bunch of fun little extra features and bonus episodes and bonus content that we put out once a month that you can check out over there. If you want a third and fourth vanity URL for how to get to the Patreon, <laughs> we will make that for you. Anything slash anything slash bribe us slash free money for us. Whatever you want it to be, just uh, go ahead and email us at boardgamebarrage at gmail.com and we'll set up that vanity URL for you. That's one of the Patreon tiers, is your own vanity URL. So let's get into it for this week, though. 
We are drafting games number 101 to 200. And I just saw everyone tense up and That's start right. to pull up their little documents and data. That was exciting. Everyone got very serious for a hot second there. Because things are serious. This is the Board Game Barrage Fantasy Draft. If you've not heard one of these episodes before, the way this is going to work is we're going to snake draft the 100 games on this list. So we're going to wind back and forth like a Nokia 3310 version of Snake. <laughs> I was told that that is the correct pronunciation. Thank you very much, Kellen. I don't agree, but that's fine. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Like, there are different pronunciations depending on where you are Yeah, in the totally. World. But I would assume that that and is... Where the... are you kneeling again? Uh, I, mm, I don't know. Oh. You start. don't know where you are right now. No. That's interesting. Seven that's hours in a pub and kneeling's forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. But yeah, we're going to be snake drafting this. So we're going to be going back and forth, picking games until we have a five game collection. And the idea is whichever one of the three of us has in your eyes, the best five game collection, you will give us your vote by going to boardgamebarrage.com slash draft. And every single person who votes will get a chance to win a $50 gift card to their board game online retailer of choice. How is everyone feeling? Going into draft number three. I'm feeling okay. Yeah, I bet you are, Mark. I was hoping that some really good game had dropped to the 101 slot. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> From the, because this BGG changes like every five yeah. minutes. It's like every time you look at the top 100, a new game from 2021 has entered the list. But I don't think there is any big ones. But I could be wrong. And I would love to be wrong and spoiled while we draft. <laughs> so one more quick bit of business to figure out before we get started is who who's going to be taking the first pick this time so around? i think it should be choice in reverse finishing order of the last draft according to the votes by the listeners so neil and finish third right so you can pick whatever position you want first second or third pick oh i don't know that's it's so interesting because i i i mean obviously the snake draft throws a spanner in the works a little bit I'm inclined to say that it's still best to just be the first pick, given that we're picking five games. Yeah, why not? I'll do first pick again. Okay, so Neilan takes first pick. Kellen, do you want the second pick or the third pick as the second loser? Excuse me? Second loser. I don't, I'm not sure I heard that part. Uh, Your voice is uh, very low, like you've yeah, been drinking so all there's, day. So there's two losers and one winner. Neilan was okay. the first loser. You were the second loser. Is first loser the guy who gets second? Second loser? I feel like you need to get your terms really... Second loser is the guy who gets okay. second. Second loser. Yeah, they're both second, the first... remember, because second and second. <laughs> they're, both, they're both not first, right? That's what you're saying. <laughs> I hear you. I do not want to be on the clock twice. That is okay. not my preferred position, so I, will, I, will, I will be second. Okay. So we'll go Neelan, Kellen, <laughs> <laughs> Kellen, Neelan. Right, that's what I have written down here. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so it's me for the first pick. <laughs> and well, obviously, I, you have the pick ready. Yeah, I regret everything immediately. <laughs> okay, I am going to come in hot with a game that I'm pretty certain there's no chance in hell is going to make it back to me, which is Hansa Teutonica. Yeah, it would have been my yeah. first pick. I assumed... You don't even like Hansa Teutonica as I much as us. Hansa Teutonica, how dare you? Liar. When was the first time you played it? Uh, not very long ago. Oh, wow, really? <laughs> Can you tell that I'm salty? But you're still <laughs> you're still my friend, Neilan. Thank you, um, Alan. If anything, the two of us need to figure out how right, to Right, exactly. Up. Whatever happens, Mark must lose. That yes. is the only that's, important thing. That's the real goal here. Yeah, I, I guess very, very quickly, Hunts of Titanic Air is an awesome, feisty Euro game. It has a, it had a very big resurgence. It was already quite popular in our community and in board game hobbyists at large, but the big box production that was put out last year, I think, has brought a new audience to it. So I think this is an especially timely pick of a fantastic game. I think it has the synergy so well of Euro players and people who prefer a little bit more feistiness, and it also gets out of its own way, and it's not three and a half hours long. So I think it just has a lot of cross appeal, a lot of cross appeal. And it was definitely number one on my drafting board, no question. Yep, same here. Gutted. 
All right, I am up with the second pick of this draft. It's funny, I have the board game geek list up, which has the little pictures, which helps me kind of vibe, you know, like I have a spreadsheet that I have created using some of my own metrics and filters. The algorithm, we call it. The algorithm. (laughs) But I keep going back to the pictures because my spreadsheet, unfortunately, is just the name, so I can't like evoke it, you know, in my mind. I get that. I totally get that. (sighs) One of the things that's challenging is like, is trying to pick games that cannot be replaced by other games. And my first pick... I am mildly concerned because there is a few direct, direct competitors to it in the top 100 to 200. But with the first pick of this very special draft, I will select 2016's release, Inish, by Matago Games. So Inish is one of the preemptive dudes on a map, people on a whatever, people on a plane games. Everyone loves it. The Board Game Barrage listeners love it. It is high in our top list, and it is sitting at 105, so it feels like a great first pick. The downside of a pick like this, and I'll just illustrate it out loud because I've always been the voice of the people, is that you still have Comet, Cyclades, and Chaos in the Old World all in 100 to 200. So I am predicting that the change in value between Comet and in is high enough that it is worth drafting first, which may or may not be true. And my next question is the tryhard question. Comet Blood and Sand is not in 100, in 1 to 200. So if someone selects Comet, they would be doing so knowing that there was a superior version. So I wait, which of you two dumbasses selects that game? I love it. God, I love this. I love the way you twist this. So good. (laughs) I genuinely do. Okay. So I had a top four. And you both have selected two of the top four. So I'm left with two that I thought were were in the upper tier. But now I'm a little shaky. But I'm going to go with the two that were left over in the upper tier for me. With my first pick, I'm going to go with Cosmic Encounter. Wow. For the variability, for the eventness of it, looking for a game that I think is sort of a one-of-a-kinder. One way to, to approach this is to go for a well-rounded sort of collection. And I think that Cosmic Encounter is sort of a, like I said, a one-off and not easily replaced by something else or substituted with something else. So I'm going to go Cosmic Encounter first. And then for my second pick, I'm going to go with the game that cannot be killed despite all efforts, a Splendor. Very interesting. It is interesting. Cosmic Encounter and Splendor are my first two picks. See, they're both, and again, my live commentary uh, has proven to be drastically wrong. So take that for what it's worth, uh, as I am the first or second loser, uh, depending on how much alcohol Mark has consumed. (laughs) But Cosmic Encounter is such a spiky one where there's those people who absolutely love it and must have it in their collection. And then there's a lot of people who take a big umbrage and just go, it's Munchkin, LOL, I hate Munchkin. And I feel like when you play to the Euro crowd, you're safe. Like, that's the base. You know what I mean? That's the base of the whole hobby now. And so you're not playing to the base. And again, with Splendor, Cosmic Encounter was near the bottom of my list, but I still thought I could get it in the fourth or the fifth. Splendor is another one where there's this, like, love and there's this hate. And the hate is, like, kind of spiky and weird. So both great picks and, honestly, on my draft board, but, like, ones that I kind of, again... You've beaten me, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, absolutely. The Cosmic is, like you said, so spiky that I I could lose people just on that pick alone. I think there are a number of good Euro games that I would be happy with any of them. I mean, yeah, Hansa are all the same, right? Is that what you're saying? Can I can I get you to say that, Mark? That's all Euro games are the same. Can you say that? That's not what I said. I think I heard it. So I would also say there's a lot of Splendor level games in terms of weight. But I think Splendor is a step above all of them. So it just felt like a different class. So that's why I want Splendor. But tough, definitely tough. Oh, now I have to go again. Yep. Wow, that's how a snake works. Um, Something I learned. I do not like this. I do not like this one bit. Honestly, like literally my top seven have already been taken, (laughs) which is crazy. And that I don't think there's seven games have been chosen. (sighs) All right, with the second pick of the fantasy draft, I will select the best co-op game that has ever existed, Pandemic. Now, 
This could be a controversial pick, given that we've all lived through a pandemic together, but I'm going to go that it is the 104 ranked game. I am confident that people love pandemic. I am looking at my special Excel chart, my special, special formula, which I'll reveal the secret to you now. All I did was, well, actually, no, all I did, just to be clear, I found out how to export data from BGG. So I exported the top 100, and then I sorted by the number of voters on each game. That's all I did. But don't you can't do that this vote. <laughs> you have to wait till the next vote to do that. And Pandemic is number one with 105,000 votes. And then it goes down to 104,000 on the second place, and then 79,000 for the third ranked game. So quite a big jump. So ranked very high, very well known, and also just a ton of votes. So I feel confident in Pandemic. I know that many people will go, but I like Pandemic Iberia. And, you know, I don't think that my pick of Pandemic Legacy in the Patreon vote, I don't think it helped me very much. I could be wrong. Mark, you like Pandemic? Honestly, it was not on my short list. Yeah. Because, I don't know, I think if you are going to appeal to the Pandemic crowd that listens to... You're going a different way. That, that listens to board game podcasts, you're probably going a different way. I agree you're casting the, the widest sort of net, but I don't know who you're catching that listens Didn't to board game podcasts. Didn't work last podcast. time, is what you're saying. I mean, who knows? Who knows? I was lucky to win the first one for sure, so... Oh, now he's going for humility. Don't listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being serious. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest question I always have, which is, is related to that pick, Kellen, is kind of just like how much a game's age factors in. And I just genuinely right. don't know, because what you have there is a wider base by virtue of just how many people have played it. But there is also just kind of this, you lose the recency bias a little bit. It's a hard it thing to figure like out. It feels like an evergreen. There are yeah, I, I would novels. agree with that. It, it's definitely Neil and- in the echelon of classics. It is absolutely an evergreen. Neil yeah. has committed to reading the pandemic novel um, and <laughs> yes. reviewing it as the preemptive critic on the Board Game Barrage exactly. podcast. There is a pandemic novel that you can read that is real. Funnily enough, there's also, they just announced a pandemic World of Warcraft game, which starts to really stretch the pandemic name and franchise to its like absolute thinnest. But regardless, I'm looking at my next two picks here, and I'm actually very pleasantly surprised to see that Mark did not pick Kemet because I do think it was a one that was jumping out at me a lot. I knew it wasn't going to be Kellen's second pick, so I was very relieved that it's still the old version of Kemet. Yeah, the old yeah one. yeah the old the the old classic. Everyone loves it. No one likes the new art in Blood and Sand. Kellen, you know they made like a new one that fixes it, right? Yeah, and half of those changes are in like these two point rules that you can just download for free as a PDF. So oh, oh so the people are includes, smart. The people are smart. Includes that. Yeah, of course, it? of course. It includes the, includes the two point <laughs> rules that are freely available on the internet. Interesting. <laughs> Uh, I think my next pick is going to be Comet. I think it's as simple as that. I, I think that this Troops in the Map genre is one that I have a lot of love for. We have a lot of love for. People have a lot of love for. And Comet is widely loved. I think, Kellen, one of the things you said that rings true is to steer Euro. <laughs> and Comet is about as steering Euro as you can get in this genre. It is kind of like the Euro gamers fighting game, if that makes a lot of sense. I completely disagree with that classification, and not just because Wait, what we're in, in a battle to the death. Kemet is nothing like a Euro game. But it's, it's, it's like one of Euro the fightiest game fighting games. It's it's deterministic. It uses like a resource management system. Like it, I mean, not to say that it's extremely Euro, but I do think that a large part of Kemet's design is Euro sensibility oriented. Regardless... I just don't think I've ever heard anyone say that, to be honest. Interesting. Again, I could be wrong, and I'm not doing a bit. I'm literally No, no, like, no. I'm not, like, even trying to like, make the argument that that's, like, a way that command is classified. Yeah. I've always just seen it as that way in my mind. Yeah. Like, it's not dice rolly. It kind of caters to sure. that same audience of just, like... But then isn't everything you've said about Kemet applies to Inish? I get there's a layer of negotiation. Look, I mean, I would have picked like Inish before Kemet if it was available. Interesting. So, Kemet is going to be my second pick over here. And then... I'm torn. I think I know where he's going. Mark, you know where he's going? I have a feeling. Me too. I think that I... Star Wars miniatures game, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Parks. One of the things I'm so scared about in this whole thing is how light to steer for some of this. And I think I'm in a good ballpark by steering lighter with a very beloved game here in the Doctor's own Ra is going to might be my third pick. Interesting. 
That was not what I had written down that I passed to Mark on a note card. <laughs> uh, digitally, of course, since we have haven't seen each other in two years. Raw is a auction game by, by Rainer Knizia. It, it is very, very, very beloved. I think at the t- all the times I can remember thinking back to past episodes of the podcast where we were talking about Knizia games and talking about auction games, I feel like there was this, this ongoing clamor of you guys need to play and talk about Raw. And I have a feeling like there's a lot of love for it. It, it feels to me like probably one of Knizia's most beloved games. Absolutely. So yeah, for sure. I mean, for sure. It was definitely on my short list. That is my my number three pick. I just want to, for the listeners voting, uh, make a little plea here. Neelan's critique of Pandemic was that it was old, coming in uh, Uh, in 2008, and then he selected Raw, a uh, a game that's coming to you from 1990. I want to make it clear that that was not a critique of Pandemic, which was on my short list. It's kind of, it's just this internal debate. Now it's on his short list. No, no, it it was. Now it's there. It's just just this internal debate of like, am I steering wrong by going with the classic? But I think the conclusion that we came to is that there is a tier of classics that surpass that. Uh, Now he's doing an internal debate. He won't even debate out loud. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, to be honest, I have lost a lot of my confidence as a result of these two drafts that we have done. And so as we round the corner here, I just, I am just in pain as I look at the games that are available. I just want to draft them all. But I cannot, and so I will draft something that actually I have less experience with. We are going straight to one Mr. Martin Wallace out of 2002 and drafting uh, Age of Steam. Oof. Now, you've hurt me with that pick. I've, of course I've hurt you. Everything I do, I try to hurt you. <laughs> uh, Age of Steam is, and Mark, feel free to jump in. Age of Steam is one of Wallace's classics. I believe it's been re-implemented a ton of ways to Sunday, and there's different versions and, and maps. And There are a million maps, yeah, for sure. But I believe what has happened is is most people have kind of settled on Age of Steam as one of Martin Wallace's best I have only played this game the one time. I enjoyed it very much, and I would love to play more Age of Steam, my third game. And for those keeping track thus far, my collection is a little weird with uh, Inish, Pandemic, and Age of Steam, but I feel like Age of Steam sits in that sort of spiky, and I've said spiky a lot, so forgive me, uh, place where Mark selected Barrage in the Patreon episode, and then in the original draft selected Pax Pamir, which is sort of this gamer game that is not a Euro game that exists outside of that sort of, it's the John company. It's that one game that they love to play that's more economic and it's almost like 18xx, man. Age of Steam, the third game from my collection. You didn't anticipate that from me, Mark. I did not. I did not. I thought that would drop. I probably would have taken it among these two picks if it had fallen, but uh, you have thwarted my ambitions here. You know, it's crazy because... In the third and fourth round of the last draft, I felt like there was so much to pick from. You know, you wouldn't think going from the top 100 to the next 100 would feel so much tighter, but it just feels like the upper echelon, there's quite slim pickings at the top tier. It's just so weird, right? Because it's like, and I I don't want to pick on any game here, but it's sort of like Cartographers is the 114th best ranked board game of all time. And I like Cartographers. Yeah. And I would happily play Cartographers. But like sitting here against like, well, is it better than Chaos in the Old World? It's right. sort of like, what? Like, what? <laughs> why is this here again? Right. So the issue that I'm having is that I think that the best games left over are light here, which is sort of interesting because I felt like in the top 100, it felt like there was a dearth of uh, lighter games. And here it feels like of the games that I would choose from, there are a, a number of lighter ones, but I don't want to go too light. Time Stories, right? Time Stories, right. Well, I just want a Time Story expansion, actually. Can I just get one of the expansions? Yeah, that's there somewhere. Okay. (laughs) Perfect. Sushi Go Party. I mean, that's a good one. That is a good game. Yeah, it's a good game. game. Put your money where your mouth is, Mark. Yeah, pick it. All this raving about Sushi Go over the years. Pick it. Sushi Go is a heck of a game, and I stand by it. And I think the Australian people would, would back me for choosing one of their own Phil Walker Harding's game classic game that's sold at targets all over the place or lest you forget uh, the amount of money that target gives to us which is millions millions of something okay with the third pick halfway through for me i'm gonna go with what i think is 
the best of the remaining heavy games. I think there are a couple heavy games out there that are good, that are left over. But I think there is a definite step between the best one available and the next group. So I'm going to go with the progenitor of games like Blood Rage and the dudes on the map, a Renaissance, by selecting Chaos in the Old World, which, which I think gave birth to Blood Rage, which gave birth to Cthulhu Wars. It's a tough one because it's a hard one to get, and it's one that I don't think a lot of people have necessarily played because it's so hard to get. But if you've played Blood Rage... If you played Cthulhu Wars, maybe you could say you have played it in some way. Chaos in the Old World, for those who have played it, will know how much games like Blood Rage and, and Cthulhu Wars owe to it. Just a great design, and I think it is, to me, clearly the best of the heavy games left over. So I felt like if that one was taken, there would be a significant drop-off. Although I think of the leftover heavy games, a lot of them are probably more popular, but I think Chaos is clearly the best in my mind. So, for my fourth pick, I think for my fourth pick, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go with a game that is a type of game that I've really fallen back in love with recently, which is the quick playing deck builder. And what better way to go with a quick playing deck builder than to go with the quick playing deck builder, the one that started it all. So another progenitor of the sort of deck building genre of games. So I'm going to go with the top rated game of this list. Number 101, Dominion is what I'm going with. Playing Race for the Galaxy, even playing Summer Camp really has reignited my love for games that just go really, really quick. You know, it's your turn. You play your your action and it's the next person's turn and, and there's no downtime. It goes so, so fast. And, you know, Dominion is the first game in this type of game, but still one of the best, if not the best. So I'm happy with Dominion as my fourth pick. I think that's a good. This idea. list is so weird, right? These games just feel so weird. They do actually, from. and I'm sort of starting to like see what Mark is saying about a weird lack of heaviness in this set of hundred compared to the first set hundred. Yeah, of the best games in my opinion, I think this is a much lighter batch. All right, I have my fourth pick. I think that. I am trying to make a collection which sort of spans up and down the heaviness scale, up and down the newness and oldness scale, something for everyone, which can be a bad strategy, right? If you're looking to capture the hearts of like one specific type of gamer. But with the fourth game of my collection, I will pick 2019's Res Arcana. This is one of the latest Thomas Lehman designs who made Race for the Galaxy. Res Arcana does a lot of the same notes as Race for the Galaxy, but in a different theme, in a different way, and an even quicker package than Race for the Galaxy. It takes away a little bit of the interaction that's inherent in Race for the Galaxy, and I think makes a game that is even more appealing to the standard euro players there is a lot of game in this box it is a beautiful production i love all of the components in res arcana i would never never ever turn down a game of res arcana and i think it works really well as sort of a splendor plus with quite a lot more going on as well so i think this spans quite wide for me Uh, i'm very happy to have it in the collection but i do think i'm going a little eclectic with sort of inish and age of steam and res arcana and pandemic just feels a little all over the place, but I'm hoping that that feels like a nice collection that you'd want to have that set of games. I like this pick. This was on my short list. It's also newer and hotter, yeah. you know, than some of, like some of these games have like been around for a, a long time. I mean, Dominion, <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. Cosmic Encounter. <laughs> it feels a little bit like this place that really highly rated games from a while ago right. sort of ended up too, yeah. just by the algorithms. It's probably not wrong at all. Okay. I keep doing this thing where all my games are like near the top of the actual rankings, and it has not worked out for me at all. I think I know my fourth. I just don't know my fifth. You gotta be Carcassonne, bro. Gotta be. Gotta be. Gotta be the Descent Journeys into the Dark Second Edition. Yeah. Or Cyclades to kind of pair with your, you know, you want a theme, and your theme is worse dudes on a map games than Inish. Or Century Golem Edition, yeah. worse Splendor. That's you could go for that. Yeah. That's a good idea. Uh, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot and reacting to is just the lack of heavy games remaining on the list. And 
kind of also feeling that maybe I think you know Hansa covers that a little bit, but there is something to the appealing to like the heavy Euro crowd with a game that is. I mean, it's high up on the BG list. I like it a lot, and I, I feel like it's liked in our community. This might be. I think this is a good pick. I'm going to go with Yokohama. Hmm. As my fourth pick. But have you been there? Before? I have not been there. This is where you ask Kellen. Have, hey, Kellen, have you been to Yokohama? Oh, funny you ask. Ah. Yes, I have been. Ah. It's very lovely. I went to a festival there. Fireworks. Very cute. That was thoughtful of you to ask, Neilan. <laughs> that is right in character for Neilan. And so. then the question I'm left with is what is my number five pick of what's left here? And I'm looking a little bit at what I may be missing. I'm definitely missing something on the party end, but I'm scared to go that route, <laughs> given how much it may have burned me before. You could pick a good game for your fifth one. I could. I could. In fact, I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick oh, wow. a crazy. good game. It's <laughs> crazy strategy. That Changing is perhaps, it up. I wouldn't call it like... Let's call it... I mean, it's a party game, but it's, it's party adjacent, I think. This hurts me a little bit because the resistance is right there. But I'm going to pick Deception, Murder in Hong Kong as my fifth yeah. pick. Because I think that is a... Of the party games, of the social deduction games, as much as I personally love the Resistance Avalon, and if this was my personal list, obviously it would be on there, I think Deception with Murder in Hong Kong has much broader appeal. And it's a game I love. That is of no loss of love on my part. And it has been successful with pretty much everyone I've talked to. It has a little bit more heft to it in that realm of party social deduction. I think that's going to round on my list pretty nicely across weight and sort of diversity of genre. I actually think, Mark, looking at this, that Neilan may have won. Yeah, I think that he's probably, I think he's probably the favorite. I think Hans is a strong pick. There's diversity, but it's also like one person. What do you mean? That would want all five of those. I see. It feels. Oh, we haven't finished drafting yet. We haven't finished drafting yet. Well, I was hoping maybe if I said something, then you might say something that would help <laughs> oh, me. With yeah, my sure. Pick. No, you know what? I agree with you, Kellen. I just think that he erred by not going with Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game. Oh, <laughs> oh was, shoot. Did I just say that? That was his Don't misstep. Yeah. Oh, that. Actually, I am surprised that Neilan did not pick Alchemist. Yeah, um, I was considering it. I, that's one of those games where I feel like my love for it doesn't match the community's love for it a little yep. bit. Okay, so it's my pick, and so I will just come out and say it. I am debating between two games. I am debating between Aura et Labora by Uwe Rosenberg, uh, a beloved game, but not one of his top like four or five, right? But still in the top 200, one I have not played and one that I am excited about playing. And number 112, Vinos Deluxe Edition by one Mr. Vital Lacerda. My concern with the Vital Lacerda is... My collection just feels, again, so weird with Pandemic, Inish, Res Arcana, and Age of Steam. I love this collection, and I, I would go to bat for it, but it just feels weird. And adding either of these Euro games feels a little bit like outside the scope of my collection. With that said, I have decided... So what I did was a little bit of psychology where I, as I said the games, I looked at Mark's face. <laughs> I looked at his face. Uh, so I tricked you. Uh, and I'm picking number 112, Vinos Deluxe Edition. This has a fantastic theme of winemaking, as made popular by wine. Ever heard of it? <laughs> uh, as... <laughs> As also made popular by Viticulture, uh, a Stonemeyer game. But this is about building a winery. This is Vital Lacerda. We have talked about his games, one of the most prolific designers of the last 10 years. This is a deluxe edition, right? So these components are upgraded. I don't know how, but they are upgraded. So if you want cool bits, Vinos Deluxe Edition, the last game that I will be drafting for this top five list. Yeah, for, for whatever it's worth, Kellen, like, in my heavy consideration, it was between Yokohama and Vinyas. Like, the, those were the two I was trading off in my head. I don't know that I picked the right one, considering the Lacerda love, but... Yoko is a weird one, right? Like, I have it, 
but I don't feel like I hear about it that often. Even I mean, it's you know, 109th best game of all time. So it, that's a it's an interesting one. So, Mark, what do you got yeah. for us? You wanted that. You wanted it bad. No, I, I, I it, saw. It, I, well, <laughs> your eyes. What was the other one you had? It was Venus and what? Aura at Labora. Yeah, actually, Aura was on my shortlist and Venus was not, although I think Venus is probably the superior game. I just wonder how thin the Vitella Serta niche is. Yeah. Like, I wonder if that's a little too much. But I think you're going to get a lot of people who are big fans of it, like voting for you instantly, just having that on the list. So I was worried about it being a little too too small of, a, of an area. But, okay. So, look, I'm just going to lay it out here straight. Everybody knows that I'm the heart guy, right? I go with my heart. I don't do analytics. I don't worry about crunching the numbers. I just go with my heart. I put my heart out on the line, right? Everybody agrees to that, and they're all nodding. So I have been left in the same situation in this draft <laughs> that I was in the first draft. Ladies and gentlemen, I was, I'm was. i left in the same situation, okay? Put yourself in my shoes. I'm sitting here with the last pick. Neilan has failed to pick the game that was his favorite game of all time year after year. What am I to do? What can I do? <laughs> but I have stick to a do dagger it. I have into to do my it. heart. After I made the, my last pick, there were three games that were on my short list. Okay? One of them was taken. I won't say which one. But the one that I probably would have taken has to be this because I can't allow Neilan, after years of saying this is the best game of all time, and leaving it to me as the last, the final, we've gone through Tens of games, tens and tens of games. And tens Nealon, and tens? Tens and tens of games. I haven't done the math. I'm not the math guy. I'm the heart guy, so Great. I don't know exactly what the numbers are. Yeah, but use your heart there. After all these picks, how can I allow Neilan to be a hypocrite and let this game go unpicked? I got to go with it. And so for the last pick, I'm going to go with, again, Dead of Winter. <laughs> I listen to a lot of board game podcasts. Neilan of the Board Game Barrage called this the best game of all time. He's now called it, he's dropped all the way to his second yeah. best game of all time, of all games that have ever been created. So to round out my list, I'm going with the Resistance Avalon. Yeah, I figured this was coming. I mean, I had no choice. You, It's out of my hands at this point. <sighs> Let's go around and read our lists one more time. The five games that I dropped. But Neilan. Yo. Here's what we got to do. Yeah. You give a 30 seconds on why your list is the yeah, best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Mark and I each get a 15-second rebuttal. Okay. Sure. Yeah, sure, I, I like that. Oh, okay. I like yeah. that, sure. Okay, so here we go. My list is Hansu Teutonica, Komet, Ra, Yokohama, and Deception Murder in Hong Kong. I think the reason my list is the best is I think I've clearly hit a wide swath of genres. We've got fighty games. We've got Komet, the fightiest of the fighty games we've got hansa teutonica what do i need to say about hansa teutonica it is a feisty euro classic euro game that has been re-released in a beautiful package deception murder in hong kong the game that straddles the line between social deduction and party and a gamer's social deduction game ra the much beloved auction game by the doctor himself in his auction trilogy the creme de la creme of the auction games by Mr. Oh, by Mr. Whoops, I'm sorry. By Doctor Knizia, and then Yokohama. I think I needed like a heavy Euro game. This is one that I. It seems to have a lot of weight behind it. I like it a lot in in my couple of plays of it, and it, it sort of has that long legs and that heavy weight category that I think is going to appeal to a lot of people. I think I've covered a broad range of weights and genres, and vote Nealon. Okay, Hansa Teutonica is overrated. Okay, let's <laughs> yeah, just start it was your there. your number one pick. Excuse Khaled. me? Oh, uh, this is my 15 seconds, Judge. Uh, did you, you look at the algorithm? Up? No, Hansa Teutonica is liked by all, but not anyone's favorite game of all time. Raw is an extreme overreach, and I don't know what parties Neelan is at, but we are not playing Deception Murder at Hong Kong at my parties. Thank you, the defense for us. Okay, so... I will agree that Hansa is a great pick. It is a great pick at number one, but he had the number one overall pick. How much do we want to really reward him with making the obvious pick? That's true. I'm saying, I agree with it. I'm just saying, come on, pretty clear, pretty obvious. Be frank, I like Komet. I like Raw. I like Deception as the last pick. I think it's a good value pick. I think Yokohama feels like the one that sticks out as the mistake to me. 
I think there are games that do what Yokohama does that were not drafted that I think maybe were even better on this list. So I think it's a strong list. I just think that Hansa, obvious, Yoko, the one that sticks out as the weakest. You could say you kind of hit the pole, right? Right. With that pick, Yokohama. I think Yokohama was his Yoko owner. No, that's not a good joke. <laughs> All right, the five games that I have selected for this draft is Inish, Pandemic, Age of Steam, Res Arcana, and Vinos Deluxe. What we have here is a true range. Neelan spoke about range earlier, but no one believed him. His games are all sort of hitting in the same weight. We are going from dudes on a map. We are going to the lightest co-op game that everyone can play, Pandemic. Everyone has played We are going all the way to economic train games with Age of Steam, lighter card games that still work for gamers, and the heavy of the heaviest, Vinos Deluxe with Mr. Lacerda. If you wanted one collection, this would be the one that would give you the most variety out of all of these lists. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. (laughs) It's all here in the list. Inish is... Beloved, amazing, features that negotiation. Pandemic is for that lighter game night. Age of Steam, when you've got the bros over, when you really want to go for it. Res Arcana, I don't know. I don't have anything to say. The games speak for themselves. (laughs) You should be voting for me in this draft. Select Inish, Pandemic, Age of Steam, Res Arcana, and Vinos Deluxe. So I will say that I think Inish is a great pick, although I think it's an overrated game without the expansion, and I don't see anything about an expansion here. So I think if you don't have the expansion to Inish, then you have a, a game that is way overrated, although I think it's a fine second pick. Pandemic, I've already said why I think it might be a risk and why it might be a reach at the two. You know, it is a much beloved game, but it's I think it's grown stale with so many other options for Pandemic. Well, I would call them superior options for a Pandemic type game. <laughs> Age of Steam is one that he stole from me. I'm not going to say anything bad about Age of Steam because Age of Steam is a great one for sure. But a niche crowd, but but a great game. Um, Res Arcana, I love the quick card game. And I know there are people, a lot of people who love it. It falls a little short for me. I think it's far inferior to Race and to a game that's on my list. I also love Venus of Deluxe. I just don't know if there's enough of an audience for it, but it is a solid game for sure. And it's a beautiful production, so... Yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting about your list, Kellen, is I think that there is like Inish Pandemic and Rezakana, which I think are a solid trio for like a specific audience. Kind of like what you were saying about like people that like one of those games, there's a good possibility that they like all of those games. But then you have these like completely opposite end of that in Venus and Age of Steam. And I think that there is value to that because you'll get those heavy hitters that are like, well, you picked a train game, so here you go. You picked a Lacerda game, here you go. But I do wonder how big that slice is, like Mark said earlier in the episode. Like, is it enough? Are people that will pick you on the basis of those two games alone enough? I don't know. I think I heard (laughs) well-rounded out of that. (laughs) Did I get the gist? Nah, I think well-rounded, you're (laughs) you're looking looking orange. You want well-rounded. And my five games are Cosmic Encounter, Splendor, Chaos in the Old World, Dominion, and The Resistance Avalon. So Cosmic, I think, is a game that does what no other game in this subset of games does. I think it's a completely unique game. And so I felt like if I didn't get it, then I would be missing something that I couldn't recapture. Splendor, I think, is the best of the light games in a section of BGG that is filled with light games. I think Splendor is the best proven by the fact that it's unkillable. Chaos was, uh, I think, the best available of the heavy games. Again, I think this this is a little light on heavy games, this 101 to 200, but I think Chaos is by far the best. It's a little risky because it's tough to play and tough to find, but I think it is the best. Speaking of the best, the best uh, deck builder, the number one, the classic deck builder, Dominion, I, there's, I think there's not much to argue there. And then, you know, don't take uh, my word for it, take somebody else on this show with the resistance avalon i don't even have to argue for it and i'm curious to see how neilan will down talk my pick of the resistance avalon for the fifth pick overall oh it's, it's easy like if you wanted a hundred neilans to vote in your favor then they may but i think our audience of the two games of deception and the resistance i think our audience has more love for murder okay. in hong kong and i think that, that that was the balance for me too for the two of them it's kind of what kellen was saying with, with alchemist i love the resistance obviously i love the resistance but i do think mm. it's not 
it's not it's on not the level anymore. with the way that everyone loves the resistance. You talk about having a hundred Neelands as being a bad thing. I think having a hundred Neelands is lovely, frankly. I mean, so, don't we all? Uh, uh, if only we well, had hundreds like of do. Neelands in our audience, but that's not well, your reality. It, though, right? <laughs> exactly. They're growing up fast <laughs> one day. There's a couple of picks that actually, I, I'm not going to say surprise me, Mark, about yours, but in the realm of Chaos in the Old World, I get what you were saying about the weight, but I feel with like with a Cyclades still there and available, that, that surprised me as a pick. And Splendor is another one where I'm with Kellen in a little bit. Is it the right light game pick of a myriad of options that were, were available? I'm not sure. I think Cosmic Dominion and the Resistance are, are a solid trio for sure. Just remember, guys, that he is a traitor as he doesn't even like Cosmic Encounter. <laughs> so if you really like Cosmic Encounter, you actually should vote for my collection of Inish Pandemic HFC. <laughs> yeah, how's that? how was uh, the last Pandemic game, Kellen? I forgot. Uh, 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 it went l- so well. I didn't quarterback <laughs> once. No, Mark, you actually have surprised me the most now. Foot and mouth, you know, hand and foot disease or whatever. I have been wrong miraculously over and over again here, but these picks surprise me cosmic encounter again it's funny that you say it's so unique nothing else can do it right after a pick of inish which is negotiation is a little munchkin they both get compared to munchkin in in a weird way i don't think they're that similar but i don't think cosmic encounter is that crown jewel that you think it is and then i think chaos in the old world is so old that my guess is one out of ten of our audience have even played it that's fair but, and then I think about, you know, we also left uh, Quest for Eldorado, Reiner Knizia's deck building game, which I was shocked that Neelan did not pick. Yeah, when we were talking, Kellen, yeah, about like, Raw. Me the note. Yeah, 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 that's exactly uh-huh. what I thought it was going to be. Yep. Yep. That was in close contention for the number five spot, for sure. It just seemed, with deception yeah. there, it just felt not correct. And I think that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Board Game Barrage podcast. As a reminder, if you want to vote... In the draft and stand a chance to win a $50 gift card, you're going to head over to boardgamebarrage.com slash draft and pick who you think has drafted the best collection of five games. That's boardgamebarrage.com slash draft. Otherwise, you can check us out on all of our social media. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. Please head over to our Discord at boardgamebarrage.com slash Discord. It always gets really, really, really spicy after these drafts as people are debating back and forth on what the best picks were and what the obvious picks that should have been picked that weren't. So please join the chat if you want to at boardgamebarrage.com slash Discord. But that's going to do it for this week's episode of the show. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you to Heart Society for our intro and outro music, What's On Your Mind, Kid. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. So that is Mercado de Lisboa by Uwe Rosenberg and I forgot his name already. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Not not Uwe. Oh, shoot. He uh, was and, there, maybe, yeah. <laughs> hanging out. Uh, and that is Mercado de Lisboa by Rick. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Me too. Um, okay. I was just looking to see. It might be funny if... Uh, can you guys, can you hear the fire? Yeah, yeah okay. it's coming through. I live next to a fire station uh, for safety purposes <laughs> um, in case anything sets on fire or the local KFC you know those air those fryers are that's what I figured most of the traffic was going to from the <laughs> yeah they're all headed fire there fire. right <laughs> um, I was holding holding just looking at the pictures looking at the pictures holding I'm going to keep holding until one of you laugh, so we could be here a while. Holding. <laughs> Go f*** yourself. Where's the laughter uh, soundboard now? Yeah, we do. So, we have it. I should have played it.